The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face. And he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato. Though in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared, he prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. In this respect I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk, one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on the tight-fitting parti-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, my dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you were looking. But I have received a pipe of what passes for a Montelado, and I have my doubts. How, he said, a Montelado? Impossible, and in the middle of the carnival. I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full Montelado price without consulting you. You were not to be found, and... I was fearful of losing a bargain. A Montelado. As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me, Lucchese cannot tell a Montelado from Sherry. And yet, some fools would have it that his taste is a match to your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults, my friend, no. I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchese, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no. It is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. The cold is nothing. Oh, Montelado, you have been imposed upon. As for Lucchese, he cannot distinguish between Sherry and Montelado. Speaking thus, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm. Putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a cloak closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honour of the time. Taking from their sconces two flambeaux, I gave one to Fortunato and bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, said he. It is farther on, said I, but observe the white webwork which gleams from the cavern walls. Nitre? he asked at length. Nitre, I replied. How long have you had that cough? <coughs> My poor friend found it impossible to reply for several minutes. It is nothing. He said at last. Come, I said with decision. Let us go back. You will be ill and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchese. Enough. 
The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I will not die of a cough. True, I said. But you should use all proper caution. A draught of this medoc will defend us from the damps. Here, I broke off the neck of a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mould. Drink, I said, offering him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer, then paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us, and I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montresors were a great and numerous family, I replied. I forget your arms. Ah, a huge human foot door on a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune lacessit. No one wrongs me with impunity. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and his bells jingled. We had passed through walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. Come, I said, we will go back ere it is too late. Your cough, it is nothing. Let us go on, but <clears throat> first, <clears throat> another draught of the medoc. Here, I broke and reached him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. Then he laughed and threw it upwards with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the gesture, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I replied. Yes, yes. You? Impossible. A Mason? A Mason, I replied. A sign, he said. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my cloak. You jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But <clears throat> let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, and again offering him my arm, we continued on our route. At the inmost recesses of the catacomb, there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains piled to the vault overhead in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner, but from the fourth, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, there appeared a still interior recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It appeared to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by solid granite. Proceed, I said, herein is the Amontillado. As for Lucchese, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend, as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed closely at his heel. In an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered him to the granite. 
In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one there depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the niche. The Amontillado ejaculated, my friend. True, I said, the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had, in a great measure, worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low, moaning cry coming from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There then followed a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier and the third and the fourth, and then came the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise went on for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction, I ceased my labours and sat down upon the pile of bones. When at last the clanking had subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, sixth and seventh tier. The wall was now about on a level with my breast, and I again ceased my labour. Holding a flambeau over the mason work, I threw a few feeble rays onto the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams, bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form, seemed to thrust me violently back. I reapproached the wall, and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with the weight of it. I placed it partially in its destined position. Then from out the niche came a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was followed by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognising as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A very good joke indeed. An excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo. <laughs> Over our wine. <laughs> the Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes. The Amontillado. But is it not getting late? Will they not be awaiting us back at the palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and the rest. Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor! Yes, I said. For the love of God! To those words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud. Fortunato! No answer. I called again. Fortunato! No answer still. Thrusting a torch through the remaining aperture, I let it fall within. There came in reply only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. 
on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labour. I forced the remaining stone into its position and plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal had disturbed them. Im pace requiescat.